darkness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished. And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Proverbs 19.5「ヨーク・ジョグラ66アワー・オブ・ザ・トゥース」。今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、今日は、ジョグラ6時間で、Actually, I wanted to start this project together with Brad Norman, but、um, well, he will join me in the later sessions of this reading, but not today. Today I'm all by myself because, you know, some time ago we finished, some time ago,、uh, I, think, uh, I think a week or two ago,、uh, we finished the reading of the book Code Word Babylon. As you know, that is on my YouTube channel. And、um, we are going to start the second、uh, volume of that book. Um, Code word Babylon, the Antichrist is a woman alive and well, also by P.D. Stewart.、Um, but that is going to be probably in a few weeks or even a few months from here. We still need time to, or Brett still needs time to produce the videos and upload this first volume because we did about, I don't know, I lost totally count of it, but it's somewhere between 80 and 100 sessions that we did on this 525 page book. And I am already for a long time pregnant with two projects that I want to do in English. And、um, the one project is the one that I'm not doing right now, so I can tell you that it's going to, become, going to come in the future, one of my projects, and that is、uh, reading the book、uh, Queen, of Queen of Islam, Queen of Rome, Queen of All. That is、um, a book about the Marian apparitions. Let me just. See if I have that here. No, it's not. Ah, here it is. Here it is. Queen of Rome, Queen of Islam, Queen of All. That's my future project.、Um, you can get that for free on the internet from eternalproductions.org. When you just、uh, Google Queen of Rome, Queen of Islam, Queen of All, you see it's about the Marian apparitions plan to unite all religions under the Roman Catholic Church. So, It's about the ecumenical movement and it's about the image of the beast. And when we read this book, we will understand that most likely the image of the beast will be the Marian apparitions. This book was written by Jim Tetlow, Roger Oakland, and Brad Myers, and this, I think, from 2006. Yeah, it's 2006. Tom Fress already read this in 2009, if I'm not mistaken, on Inquisition Update. You know him from Inquisition Update. And you can go to the archives of Inquisition Update when you are a subscriber to Inquisition Update and you have access to the archives. And then you can download the audios from 2009 and listen to Tom Fress reading this book, Queen of Rome, Queen of Islam, Queen of All. And I want to read that too. It's 160 pages, so that's a little bit、uh, quite a big undertaking to read this. But、uh, today, actually, I've come to the table to share with you my new reading that I want to do instead of, because I told you I was quote unquote pregnant with two projects that I wanted to do. And、uh, Queen of Rome, Queen of Islam, Queen of All is one, and the other one is Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. And this is the introduction that I'm going to start with today. Why do I want to read this? And well, this is an introduction because. Uh, let's see, was St. Peter the first Pope? Is it this? No, it's not this. This already I did.、Uh, 
Uh, it's a book from Ernest L. Martin. Uh, Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. Here it is. Oh no, that's this one. <laughs> huh? I have to see where, where I where I, where I leave these these things on here. Um, let's just uh, okay. I I know where it is. Just give me a second. Um, Simon. Peter versus Simon Mag. No, again. <laughs> how I, how am I doing this? <laughs> Simon the Sorcerer. <laughs> this is it. <clears throat> I always wanted to read this book. Simon Peter versus Simon the Sorcerer, or Simon Peter meets the competition by Ernest Martin. A wonderful book, only 34 pages long. It's not that big. It's not that long. But it's about that St. Paul established the Congregation of Christ at Rome and Simon the Sorcerer established the Church of Rome. It's about Peter, the Apostle, never having been to Rome. Yeah? Because that's, of course, what the, the Roman Catholic Church claims, very proudly and loudly. They are, <coughs> through apostolic succession, uh, the successor of Peter, the Apostle, and by that, the true Church of Jesus Christ. And, of course, there are many, many biblical references that refute that, um, that statement from the Roman Catholic Church. And we will learn during this reading what those are. But instead of just reading the book of Ernest L. Martin, I did my research on the internet and I found this paper uh, that I'm going to read to you now that I started here. I, I put it already in here. This is 24 pages and in the end I wrote it is from the website www.remnantofgod.org. And I know there are many people who say, oh, Jörg, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Because you are reading from uh, Nicholas from Seventh-day Adventist or Remnant, uh, Seventh-day Remnant Church uh, website articles. Oh, well, I'm very glad for people like Nicholas from the Seventh-day, former Seventh-day Adventist and now calling himself a Seventh-day Remnant uh, for providing the information that he provides on his website because those are an absolute treasure for every Bible believing Christian. The point is that and how I'm gonna how I'm gonna say that that you understand me correctly now. I am not a Seventh day Adventist and I never will be and uh, in fact I am an enemy of the Seventh day Adventist because the Seventh day Adventist church in my mind is a diabolical church. And she teaches diabolical, biblical wrong doctrine. This so-called uh, investigative judgment um, that they are teaching is absolutely satanic, in my opinion. And I hope that I can make some videos about this, maybe together with Nicholas Arthur from First Amendment Radio. Um, at least I will use one broadcast that he did with Tom Fress some time ago where he was sp speaking about that and he made videos about that and I want to show to you what the real meaning of the 2300 day prophecy of the prophet Daniel was that the Seventh Day Adventists misuse or abuse for their investigative judgment and I never read anything of Alan G. White because as far as I understand it Everything that Ellen G. White wrote was in the Bible already anyway, and she only gave it her own twist. And I do not believe in female prophets, especially not in this time, since the Bible gives a very clear explanation of the situation a woman in the body of Christ is in. And that is not, for example, preaching from the pulpits, as they do in evangelical churches, at least here over here in Europe, in Germany, for example. The whole quote-unquote Lutheran church is full of women preachers or female preachers. And I do not believe in female prophets in the end time. I just don't. And um, because I don't see any biblical reference for that either. So... Alan G. White even 
in her writings used the expression of Mother Earth, which is a New Age term. And when you ask me, I can, I can show you that. I have links here on my on my channel that I can show you that. Uh, maybe we should just do that, but then of course you have to uh, you have to be a little bit patient with me because um, the problem is <laughs> I have this uh, document somewhere on my computer. I can I can search that out, but it's gonna take a moment probably. Um, let's see when I just search SDA here. I think it's here SDA and 501c3 and SDA apostasy. This is all links about SDA apostasy. Uh, page on LNG White quotes and then uh, unbiblical teaching of Daniel 2300 days. Um, let's see. No, I don't think. Um, I don't think it's here. It must be must have been somewhere at the at the top. This is about 501c3 churches and um, oh, this is, yeah, this this must be it here. Let's have a look at this one. You know, this is live video. I don't script anything. I just go to the mic and do as the guy law tells me. So here we have uh, the occult roots of Seventh-day Adventism and uh, on this page we see here in green a writing from uh, Alan G. White. This is from the Health Reformer, first published on March 1st, 1871, and the Health Reformer published May 1st, 1871. Mar so March and May. Alan G. White referred to Earth as Mother Earth. Listen. May has come with all her beauties of the sunshine, clothing nature with a, gl with a glorious dress. Mother Earth has laid off her brown mantle and wears her cheerful robes of green. Yeah? So winter's gone, spring, spring comes and Mother Earth has laid off her brown mantle. Mother Earth is a term of New Age. And this is not the only one that she uses it. Here again, Mother Nature will take you in her lap and so on and so on. This page is as you can see as I scroll down quite long and you can do your own research on this you know I don't care for anybody believing me I just put out the truth and whether you believe the truth or not that is up to you that is not my problem I can only provide you with the things that I study and that I tell you and you do with that information and you deal with that information in the way that you want to but I'm only giving you information that I have verified and therefore I know that these writings from Ellen G. White as far as they as they are uh, available uh, that in those writings she mentioned Mother Earth and no true Christian would ever use that term but this video is not about the SDA church the point is that I wanted to tell you about um, the video that I'm going to make now and that video that I'm going to make now is about that Peter never was in Rome therefore let me just uh, get to get to another part on my computer here on videos uh, let's see my new YouTube videos here are the videos of YouTube uh, of Code Word Babylon and here we have a uh, a video that I did not publish yet so I'm just uh, putting the volume down and uh, wanna leave this here this is about one hour and 43 minutes long and uh, this video deals with the subject that Peter was not at Rome because I, I just told you um, we it's a very interesting video by the way and you can watch that shortly on my channel um, we finished shortly the reading of uh, Code Word Babylon and this is of that part because in the latter parts of Code Word Babylon uh, we came across that P.D. Stewart dealt with the subject of Peter being the first Pope 
and as I didn't read Code Red Babylon in advance, like I never read any books in advance most of the time before I go to the table and read them to you on the microphone, because I just don't have the time to study these books once, twice or even three times before I actually publish my reading of them. Most of the time it's first time my reading I put that out there. At that time, of course, I put it out that um, Oh, we were reading in Cold World Babylon about St. Peter. And it took me a little bit by surprise what P.D. Stewart had to say about this. And I was not satisfied with the broadcast we did. So next time we came together, Brett and I, I asked Brett, uh, come on Brett, I would like to do another broadcast on uh, St. Peter and how St. Peter was never in Rome because I think we didn't make our point biblically quite clear in the last reading of Cold World Babylon. I want to rectify that. So therefore we sat together and we did this and this uh, this is the result, this video here of 1 hour 43 minutes that is called Code Word Babylon, Peter, Peter's Babylon was not Rome, a short study, a short study of almost two hours. Okay, I'm going to leave this video running and um, while I'm doing to read my text, but because you know I told you already I was already a time quote unquote pregnant with the thought of doing these two books. Queen of Islam, Queen of Rome, Queen of All, and uh, from Ernest L. Martin, Simon uh, Magus versus Simon Peter. Uh, this quote unquote dispute with uh, the author of P.D. Stewart in reading Cold Word Babylon about Peter being in Rome um, actually put some weight in the scale, and uh, by that it favored uh, reading this um, Peter was not the first pope. In, uh, b before uh, before I do anything else. So <clears throat> this is why I came to the understanding that this is my next project that I'm going to do. But today on the 3rd of August, Brett has something else to do, visiting family and uh, going back together on a car trip for about 20 hours tomorrow. And therefore he will not be here tomorrow when, uh, when we do our Bible study. So tomorrow, in instead of doing our Bible study on Saturday evening, I... Um, I made an appointment with Tom Fress to come together and make a recording of uh, the understanding of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is absolutely vital to understand the Antichrist agenda and especially the historicist truth of the anti Antichrist agenda. That's why we're going to do that tomorrow. And so I thought I'm going to make already an, an, an uh, introductory video to the series of uh, that Peter was not in Rome. And then, of course, I will try in the future to do these readings together with Brett Norman so that we can have that as a, as a joint uh, project, like we did Cold World Babylon, for example, which I very much enjoyed uh, reading with uh, Brett Norman, Cold World Babylon, all the time. That was really fun. And uh, we are going to do the second book also, but in the meantime, well, you know, other projects are still luring. And as you know, for the moment, I've just started uploading The Secret History of the Jesuits uh, from Edmond Paris, the book on my channel. Uh, just today, on 3rd of August, I published the very first part of 30 parts all together to come. And I have so many other videos and surely so many German videos also on my, on my channel to come that I have too many videos and too much work and too little time. So, therefore, today I wanted just to do the introduction and I know already how far I'm going to read, so let's go to there and let's go back to my uh, understanding or, or to, my, to my point that I was making about the SDA church. When reading to you this, um, here you see this, uh, this, is the, um, this is the book that I just mentioned, Simon Peter versus Simon the Sorcerer. So when you tell me, well, yeah, you, okay, you go to remnantofgod.org and that's an SDA website and blah, blah, blah. I don't care for the SDA. But when you go to that website, take a look at the historical research that uh, Nicholas from that website did. Uh, that's too much to mention, you know. When you go to that website, you are overwhelmed. And he documents everything. He is not putting out any allegation about anything that he cannot uh, back up with uh, documents books, quotes, uh, that are openly to be found, and that's what he does. And I appreciate that very much. So he has a website that deals with the subject that Peter was not the first pope, 
and there's someone, uh, another person who whose name I uh, don't know right now, it, it doesn't even matter, uh, wrote this paper that then I changed here and there a little bit and um, he wanted to use as an introduction to the reading. Now, funny is, as you can see, this has 24 pages. It is an introduction to the book Simon the Sorcerer, <laughs> the one that you see here, uh, that only has 34 pages. Now you say, uh, 24 pages, introduction to a book reading of 34 pages. Well, uh, Ernest Martin mentions a lot of things that are not mentioned in this in this paper that we are reading now. But in this paper also already we will understand that Saint Peter was not the first Pope and that Peter even never was in Rome. So I prepared some pictures here as you can see here below pictures of uh, Saint Peter as we have here uh, this picture here where Jesus Christ says to Peter thou art Peter and upon this rock will I build my church this is from Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 this is the main reason why the Roman Catholic Church claims apostolic succession from Peter here we have a picture from the St. Peter's statue as it is in Rome and St. Peter's uh, Basilica today on the left you can see the normal one and on the right you can see a dressed one with sacred vestments and uh, let uh, watch the sun symbol there in the back that you can see probably there and by the way this St. Peter statue in Rome that is in uh, St. Peter's Basilica today uh, that is the old figure of Jupiter that used to be in the Pantheon before. Here I have a picture from uh, St. Peter's uh, disputation with Simon Magus. Yes, they met. Simon Magus, I'm sorry, Simon Magus is the guy in black on the right and uh, Peter is the one with the beige uh, toga around him and um, Simon Magus, Simon the Sorcerer, they met and therefore we go into Acts 8. This is also a part of course that we are going to read here. So these are all the things, yeah, and then this is the um, start page of the book of uh, Ernest Martin that I've chosen as a picture. But, you know, now I have this video running here. Now I'm just going to leave that video running here, so you can see this already. I'm going to upload that shortly on my channel. And now I just want to go into the introduction of Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. Because now we are going to debunk the Roman Catholic Church's allegation that she is the true Church of Jesus Christ and we will prove beyond doubt biblically and historically that the Roman Catholic Church is nothing else but pagan Rome disguised under the mantle of Christianity or what they call Christianity. Rome is not Christian in no way, shape or form. Sorry, I have to drink a little. It's still quite hot here, that's why I have my vent running. I hope you not be to be bothered too much by that sound, but um, we have about uh, 95 degrees here in my bedroom and I just can't stand it without the vent running a little bit of fresh air. Even now at this time, at 10 o'clock in the evening, yeah, we have that temperature. So anyway, I'm going to read to you Simon Peter versus Simon Magus, the introduction, and that leads up to the book reading of uh, um, Ernest L. Martin, the book that is called Simon Peter versus Simon the Sorcerer, or Saint Peter Meets the Competition, and I hope I will do those readings then together with Brett Norman, who for the moment is uh, hindered for family business. Anyway, this introduction uh, we start reading here, gives ample biblical as well as historic proof that the Apostle Peter could not possibly have been the first Pope. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 through 19 read, and by the way all quotes that I will use here are, come from, are coming of course from the King James Bible. Yeah? I have that here in, uh, in Firefox, I have it open here, Matthew chapter 16, King James Version, because I want to read to you from chapter uh, from verse 13 on in a moment, but here we are going to start with um, 
chapter 16 verses 18 through 19 and the Bible says quote and I say also, un also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven Unquote. And in Matthew chapter 18 verse 1 we read, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Unquote. We are going to deal now with these, two, uh, with, with these few verses first. Chapter 16 verses 18 through 19 and 18 through 1. But, that is a problem that I very often have. And I don't like it to take just one verse out of context and then speak about that. And that's why I opened the Bible here and said, no, we should read chapter 16 of Matthew, even from verse 13 on, to get the understanding what is being said here. And in this Bible, by the way, the red letters are the words of Jesus Christ himself. So we're going to read now Matthew chapter 16 from verse 13 on, and then we understand the context in which that quote of Jesus Christ is here in verses 18 through 19. The Bible says, when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? So he Ah, okay, I'm, I'm just going to read. I'm not going to give any explanation. We're going to do that later. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now we stop this Bible reading here. And I, I think it is very important that we read from verse 13 on. Because Jesus Christ, he is asking a question to all his disciples, the twelve disciples that were with him. And he asks the twelve of them, you know, one man asks twelve, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And now they replied, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, some other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? So this is a very different question, right? Whom say ye that I am? So he, first he wants to know from the twelve disciples, What do the people say who I am? Well, some say you are John the Baptist, some say you are Elias, which is another name for Eliah, or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. That's what they say. One says this, one says this. They are all speaking in group answering him. No person in particular. And then Jesus Christ addresses them directly and says, But whom say ye that I am? Ye, you, my twelve disciples. Now Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now why does Simon Peter answer here? People who have watched my video series on Martin Luther's reading against the papacy and institution of the devil know the answer, because Martin Luther went, went extensive, extensively on this subject. The point is that Jesus Christ addresses all twelve disciples, and Martin Luther put it in a way like twelve can sing together but they cannot speak together. You know, you can sing together because you know the you, you, because you know the text on beforehand. 
But when the question is answered, you, you, you do not know the answer. You don't know the, if the answer that you are giving is the one that the, the answer is uh, the, the one next to you giving. So when 12 disciples are being asked, whom do the disciples say that Jesus Christ is? One of the 12 must be the speaker of the 12. And he answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, of course, we understand this from the simple reading that Simon Peter answers that and that he has gotten the quote-unquote revelation, yeah, because Jesus Christ said, Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So, the point is that we understand, oh, that was only revealed to Peter. No, <laughs> this was revealed to all the disciples. Peter was just the speaker of all the disciples answering the question that Jesus Christ asked him. Because it would be unpolite not to answer. And it would be even more unpolite to talk with all twelve one over, one over the other to Jesus Christ back. So they had one speaker and that was Peter. And he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Do you hear the other disciples protesting what Peter says here? Why aren't they protesting if they are not of the same knowledge? Why aren't they protesting when they are not of the same quote-unquote opinion? Because this was revealed not by flesh and blood, to Peter, but by the Father, which is in heaven, but not only to Peter, but to all the disciples. And Peter was just the speaker of them all. And that's the point that you have to understand, and that's why it is not so wise to take Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19 out of context. You have to read it in the context. Because this is the reason why Jesus gives the answer that he is giving here. Okay? So I really want you to understand that you have to read this all together, these verses, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, to get the whole understanding of the little part that we read here already. Okay? Now let's go back to the movie. Uh, this is uh, our German brother Michael who is speaking here, and then this is his picture in the, in the video. Anyway, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus is declaring Peter as quote unquote the rock upon which Jesus builds his church. The latter part of the passage in verse 19 speaks of the duty of such a church. Now what I, and speaking of the writer of the document, do want to point out is that two chapters later the apostles are asking who is the greatest? <laughs> yeah, the Vatican declares Jesus placed Peter as the greatest in Matthew chapter 16. Uh, we just read it here. Because of this, the papacy declares Peter to be the master of all the disciples, yeah, as the greatest of all the disciples. Yet much later on, or well, not so much later on, just two chapters later on in Matthew 18, we find this is a lie. Because the apostles, of which Peter is one, are asking who is the greatest. If Jesus really did install Peter as Pope that day, as the Vatican claims, there should be no question as to who is the greatest. And by the way, the Lord Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 26, quote, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and that and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister." Unquote. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. In other words, you should not have a pope. You, not sh you should not have a hierarchy within the body of Christ. The only hierarchy within the body of Christ is Christ is the head and we are all part of the body. Jesus Christ is the head and we are all the same. We have no distinction in authority. Oh, there is a distinction in office because some can, be, can hold an office of preacher 
and of bishop, as we see later on in the Bible, of course, but that's just an office. And what you have to be, what you have to be like if you want to be a bishop, that is spoken of by Paul later in, um, in, in, in his later letters. And we can read that in another place in the Bible. But it is not that when you hold this office that you are superior to your brethren. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. When he is so great among us, that is no reason for quote-unquote authority. That is just reason for ministering to us. Then teach us. Okay? Every soul on earth will sometime come in touch with this stone. He will either fall on it and be broken, that he may be a new creature in Christ Jesus, or he will reject the stone, and at last will fall upon him and destroy him. As we can read in Matthew chapter 21, verses 42 and 44. Blessed is the one that makes Christ the chief cornerstone in all his daily work. Jesus today asks us, as he did Peter of old, so Jesus today asks us in the same way as he asked Peter in the time, Whom say ye that I am? Our lives give the answer. Peter's answer was, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This answer was given him from the Father. Now Christ responded, Thou art Peter. In these words he acknowledged Peter as his disciple, for he had given him the name of Peter when he called him to follow him. In John chapter 1 verse 42. The word Peter meant a stone or a fragment of rock. Christ's manner of teaching was to use earthly things to illustrate heavenly lessons. And he took the name Peter, meaning a fragment of rock, to direct the mind to the solidity of the confession and the stability of the cause which was found upon quote unquote the rock, Jesus Christ, of which Peter, when he accepted Christ as his master, became a portion or fragment. Every true follower of Christ becomes one of the living stones in the great spiritual building of God. Didn't Jesus Christ say, by the way, this is 1 Peter 2 verse 5, didn't Jesus Christ say, I will tear this temple down and I will rebuild it in three days? What did he mean by that? He meant, of course, on the one hand, that he was bodily resurrecting after the crucifixion, but he also meant that the destroying of the temple in 70 AD would come, as we understand from Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, and we know that the temple will be destroyed by the people of the king, of the king to come, that was Prince Titus of the Roman Emperor Vespasian at that time, and that temple was rebuilt because we are all building stones to that temple. Yeah? Jesus Christ's temple is made of living stones of the saints, the ones who believe in him here on this earth. Every true follower of Christ becomes one of the living stones in the great spiritual building of God. Christ did not say, On thee, Peter! will I build my church, but immediately changes the expression and says, upon this rock I will build my church, not on thee, Peter. Do you see the difference? And to me, this is also very important because I understand it even that way, that Peter, through the re revelation of the Father, or the Holy Ghost, or however you want to call it, Jesus Christ said, my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you, so, through the revelation of his father, he has this belief, this faith, and this faith is the rock on that Jesus Christ will build his church. Because by faith you are saved. Huh? By grace, and grace comes through faith, and faith comes through hearing the word of God. Alright? So, when you have the Word of God, when you listen to the Word of God, you will have faith, and that faith will save you. Um, that's what we read in Romans chapter 1, right? Let's just go there for a second. Um, Bible index. <coughs> Let's just go to Romans chapter 1. 
and there we can read in verse 17 and it says uh, ah, verse 17 here I was wrong for therein is the righteous of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith and it is this faith that Jesus Christ means as the rock on that he will build his church. You understand that? Not the fallible man Peter. But we are going to speak more about the fallible man Peter already. So let's just continue and let me let me assure you one thing and especially the guys who are already now typing their comments about how wrong all this is what they are hearing here. This is just the first reading of this paper of 24 pages and then afterwards the book of Ernest Martin which is 34 pages. So let me assure you those are going to be at least, I think, speaking from my experience, 30 or even more broadcasts of at least an hour speaking about this subject. Don't already quote unquote judge now what I'm saying. Yeah? But wait until the whole thing is done, until the whole thing is uploaded, and until you did your own research in this regard. Yeah? Christ did not say, as we can read in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, On thee, Peter, I will build my church, but immediately changes the expression and says, Upon this rock I will build my church. Centuries before, Isaiah had written, quote, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Unquote. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16. A sure foundation. Yeah? That's what a rock is. Yeah? Peter and every other son of Adam has failed when tested. Christ is the only one ever born of woman that has withstood every temptation and is a tried stone fit to be the chief cornerstone in the great church of God. Christ has not placed any mortal man as the foundation of his church. Sad would have been the condition of the church if it had been built upon Peter, a fallible man. For only a short time after he made the above confession, his heart was so full of evil and wrong conclusions that, as the record states, Christ said to him, quote, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offence unto me, for thou savourest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Unquote. As we can read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Thou savourest not the spiritual things, but the fleshly, material things. That's exactly what the Roman Catholic Church does. Okay? Simon Peter and Apostolic Succession. Now, we are not going so much more again yeah, until the proof one. Yeah, this is just this little one coming up. Let's see how far we are already in the video. 40 minutes, okay. So, Simon Peter and Apostolic Succession. That is what the Roman Catholic Church, of course, claims. And that's where she claims to have her authority from. Like from the fraudulent uh, donation of Constantine. Or the um, decretals of Isidore. Isidore, yeah? Um, all those exposed lies and forgeries of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Simon Peter and Apostolic Succession. Now we are going to prove, biblically and historically, that there is no way that Simon Peter, the Apostle of Jesus Christ, is the basis on the Apostolic Succession the Roman Catholic Church claims. Okay? So, one of the pillars that the Roman Catholic Church states it is built upon is that they are the first and true Church of Christ that had its beginning from the Apostle Peter. They claim that the line of popes can be traced back in unbroken succession, very important, in unbroken succession to Peter himself. Huh? You also have to understand that for this apostolic succession, actually, you need to have the old dying bishop putting on the hands of the new bishop for the over uh, for the uh, bringing over of the holy spirit and the bringing over of the authority uh, according to legend and i say legend because that's not true but that's quote unquote roman catholic legend peter was crucified in rome upside down 
how did he at that time when he died that way uh, put his hands on his successor and therefore was an apostolic succession that's the first question one can ask itself in himself without even going deeper into the subject as we are going to do right now so they claim that the line of popes can be traced back in unbroken succession to Peter himself in its concrete form apostolic succession is the line of bishops that goes from Rome stretching back to the Apostles all over the world all Catholic bishops claim to have their lineage of predecessors traced back to the time of the Apostles specifically the Apostle Simon Peter who was stated to be the first Pope of the Roman Catholic Church the role of apostolic succession is in preserving true doctrine is illustrated in the Bible so they claim now Today, as we look at the Bible and the Roman Catholic Church, we can see that there are many differences concerning doctrine. Yeah, because the Roman Catholic Church's doctrine is 180 degrees opposite to the doctrine of the, of the Bible, especially the 1611 King James Bible. These differences are not a simple misunderstanding, but at times appear to be the complete opposite of the Bible, as I just said. When one studies out the major differences between the Church of Rome and the Bible, it is not difficult to see that they have not preserved the doctrine of Christ or preserved the doctrine of the Bible. If anyone were to study such subjects as infant baptism, the Mass, Immaculate Conception of Mary, eternal torment in hell, graven images, or the Sunday Sabbath and purgatory, let me add here, they would not be able to support these ideas from the Bible. In fact, as stated earlier, these doctrines are completely opposite of the Bible. These ideas and practices have their roots in paganism and Babylonian religions. That is why the Roman Catholic Church is called Babylon, the harlot, in chapter 17 of Revelation. And I already did readings like Babylon Mystery Religion. And therefrom you know that the roots of the Roman Catholic Church are in Babylon. Where did the departure of simple Bible truth enter the Church? Now, this is an interesting question, right? Like any seeker of truth, let's go back to the beginning to see where these false doctrines came into the Church. Now, this is the problem where most people have, uh, that most people have with their own research they are just not able to trace back to the source because they are uh, relying on mince sources and they are not using biblical sources and that's the big problem because then of course you'll follow very easily the teachings that you encounter all over the internet and all over the Roman Catholic Church and then of course you are left with a dead-end road you will never come to the understanding of the truth when you are searching within the realms of the Antichrist system. So when you really want to go back to the source, and this is uh, to see where did the Bible truth, where did the departure of Bible truth enter the church, then you have to go back to the Bible and the Bible will tell you where that is. Now with the claim of apostolic succession, we'll go back to the Apostle Peter himself and see how the departing of the truth came to be. So, we just have to see what kind of life did, did Peter live at the time, where did he go, what did he teach, and where did he teach, and then we will understand whether he was in Rome or not, right? So, let's go back to the Bible. When we look in the Bible, and that's the point, do your research based on the Bible and nothing else. Everything else will just probably take you away from your goal you know you have to go back by the Bible you have to the foundation of all your studies have to be in the Bible they have to be on the Word of God when from there you go elsewhere and you see elsewhere in other words confirmed what you studied in the Bible fine but when you go somewhere else and somewhere else there is stated something that you cannot prove with the Bible then you know that that is a false teaching
And this is exactly what this study is all about, because the false teaching of the Roman Catholic Church does not come from the Bible. This is why we are here. This is why we are doing this study, and I hope you will be with me, and you will be going along with me in this study. So when we look in the Bible, there is no record of the Apostle Peter ever being in Rome, much less being the head of the church. There are countless supposed historical accounts that Peter was in Rome. Yeah, there are countless supposed historical accounts that Peter was in Rome, but they all come from Catholic sources and are not first-hand accounts. So, what does that mean? First of all, there are supposed historical accounts and they all come from Catholic sources, not from the Bible, and are not first-hand accounts. You know, the Bible only deals with first-hand accounts and not hearsay. And this is where the author of this paper is so much in my direction that I said, well, I can even read his paper here and use his paper as a basis for our study. I'm not saying that he is faultless, but I'm saying that with this understanding that he writes here, he speaks right from my heart. There are countless quote-unquote supposed historical accounts that Peter was in Rome, but they all came from Catholic sources and are not first-hand accounts. And the Bible only deals with first-hand accounts and when you come to the truth, and the truth is not um, holding up when compared to the Bible, then it is not the truth what you found. But you found an error. You found a lie. You found a departure from the simple truth, what we are looking here, right away. The earliest accounts are of Catholic quote-unquote fathers, but even they do not agree with the Bible. So, let's look to the Bible and see why the Apostle Peter was never in Rome and couldn't be the founder of the Roman Catholic Church in the first place. Below are 11 major New Testament biblical proofs which completely disprove the claim that Peter was in Rome from the time of Claudius until the time of Nero, speaking of the pagan Roman emperors ruling at that time. You know, the ones Peter, sp uh, P Peter <laughs> the ones Paul spoke of in Second Thessalonians, chapter two, verse seven. He who now letteth, huh? speaking of, he who now letteth, he who now reigns, he who is now in the way, the emperors, and the time from Emperor Claudius until Nero. That's the time that we are looking here. These biblical points speak for themselves, and any one of them is sufficient to prove the ridiculousness of the Catholic claim. Notice what God tells us. The truth is conclusive. Now the point is, these biblical points speak for themselves and any one, any one of them, very very important, any one of them is conclusive. What does that mean, that any one of them is conclusive? Well, we are going to study 11 major New Testament proofs and altogether these proofs, of course, prove that there is biblically no uh, point of connecting Peter to Rome. But even any point in itself does that. Any point in itself is already sufficient. You don't even need to have 11 points, but there are probably even more. But in this paper we speak about 11 points. Notice what God tells us. The truth is conclusive. And of course I will not go into these 11 points right now. I wanted to make an introductory video of this. And because Brother Brett cannot be with me today and I asked him to be with me on the study, I did this now alone and I will send him this video on beforehand that he can have a look at it. And then when we go into these 11 points and set the study further on, then of course I hope Brother Brett will be with me and we are doing this together. And I am doing that together with Brother Brett and I'm doing that for all of you and I'm doing that because the Holy Spirit calls me to do this. 
because he impregnated me with the idea of reading two works. The one was Simon Peter vs. Simon Magus and the other one was Queen of Islam, Queen of Rome, Queen of All. And through the circumstances of Code Word Babylon coming across that discussion, was Peter the first Pope? This is the reason why I'm doing that right now. I will start the study now and I will publish this next to the reading of um, the Secret History of the Jesuits and uh, the upcoming readings of Cold World Babylon on my channel. So there are three projects of mine running on my main channel that you can follow over there. And maybe here and there I have to even switch to another channel, but the problem is that my second channel doesn't have any views. So let's see that in the future. Anyway, I hope that everybody agrees with me on the point when I ask to you when I ask of you, please do your own research and base your research on the 1611 King James Bible when you do your research in English and research uh, and uh, base your research in German on the Schlachter 2000 Bible when you are studying in German because that's the only Masoretic and Textus Receptus true Bible in German as is the 1611 King James Bible in English. Uh, base everything that you study on the Bible and only come with arguments, quote-unquote arguments, or discussions in the comment section of this video when you can biblically refute me. I don't care for your opinion. I don't care for your research that was done outside of the Bible. Only what tells is inside the Bible. The Bible and the Bible alone. That already was the credo of the reformers 500 years ago. And that should be our credo, because that also was the credo or motto of the apostles. Scripture alone. In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus Christ was tempted after 40 days wandering through the desert, fasting, having not eaten, having not drank, drank anything, and he was tempted by the devil, and the devil tempted him three times, what was Jesus' reply? It is written. Jesus Christ cited only the words of God. And those are the only words that count and the only words that, that uh, hold up against any wind, against any flood, anything that comes. When you are built on the rock that is Jesus Christ, that is the face of the, and the love and the word of the true living God that would hold everything. That study I appreciate. Every other studies go and comment on some worldly other pages where you can spread your lies. I am not interested in them. But for the others, for suggestions, for questions and for true biblical remarks, I'm always open. So thanks for watching and thanks for listening and I hope to see you again when we come back and will unfold at least the beginning if not all of the 11 points and read on in the paper and will prove biblically and historically that the Apostle Peter never was in Rome and that apostolic succession is just the wet dream of the papacy. Until then, Maranatha. <laughs>